<laughs> We're live. Hello, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where everybody is. I'm Shudeep Sen, I'm, I'm in Delhi, and I'm uh, joined by... And I'm Fiona Sampson, and I'm on the borders of Wales. Welcome to Conclave. And we are joined by Don Krieger, who's sitting in either Philadelphia or Washington, D.C. I haven't asked him today where he's at and is being lived all over the world. This is uh, season two, episode two. And we've had a wonderful first, uh, first season. And this is uh, really going to be exciting because um, uh, quite by chance, I realize none of you are English language poets. It's all about translation uh, is something uh, we can talk about as we go along. Um, it's going to be the, the order is the same as the poster. So Yolanda Castagna will kick off the show. She will be reading in Galician and I'm told also in Spanish and in English. And Alish will, of course, lead in some Slovenian and some in English. And then Nandana uh, is uh, the daughter and translator of her mother's poetry, Navonita Dev Shen. And uh, she was a towering figure in Bengali literature. Uh, she passed away in 2019. And Nandana has just translated her book of selected poems, which has come out from Archipelago Press. And she'll be reading the translations and talking about her mother's poetry. So welcome. <laughs> Welcome indeed. And I think you'll agree, won't you, Shadiq, that not only do we have three people who swim fluently between languages, but we have three extraordinary poets who have done, who are wonderful poets from very different traditions from each other, but who are also each activists for major public protagonists for poetry. It's yeah. really good to honor their work in both, you know, the, pra the practical public field and, you know, in verse. Indeed. In fact, I'm, you know, when I'm going to be reading out the bios formally, of course, which is important. I mean, we can be informal as well as formal at the same time. And our shows tend to be serious, but informal. So I will read out the bios formally because I think it is very important. And you'll see the bios on the chat box as well. Um, of course, I'm highlighting the poetry uh, aspect of their personalities, but of course, you know, they're all major activists in their own right, as far as poetry is concerned, you're absolutely right. We're delighted so to invite all three of you and uh, we're honored by your presence. It's going to be a really exciting afternoon or evening. So Yolanda Castanio is a poet, essayist, editor and curator. She is the director of the International Writers' Residence Residencia Literaria 1863 in Coruna, in Galicia. She has published six collections of poetry in Galician and Spanish. Her poems have been translated into more than 30 different languages, including poetry volumes in English, Italian, French, Macedonian, Serbian, and Armenian. A finalist of the National Poetry Prize, she is the winner of the National Critics Award, the Esperal, Mayor Poetry Award, the Oyo Critico Award, the Standard Award, I'm probably not pronouncing all of them correctly, and the author of the year by the Galician Booksellers Association. She's ha held international fellowships uh, from IWTRC in Rhodes, Villa Balbata in Munich, HIP Beijing in China, and Hawthorne Castle in Scotland. Um, an interesting part of her personality, of course, as you will see uh, during the conversation stages, she works a lot with cross arts and she's worked her poetry and, uh, and her readings. Uh, she's collaborated with musicians, visual artists, video artists, architect, architects. Uh, there's a virtual uh, reality film in 360 degrees, which I haven't actually seen. I'd love to see that dance and cookery, my God, poetry and cookery together, that's quite something. And her latest book of poems in English translation has come out from Shearsman book in 2020 called, quite appropriately, The Second Tongue. Yolanda, it's a great treat and pleasure to have you. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm so glad to, to be here. Thank you for having me here also with all these wonderful colleagues. Um, I, for me, it's a honor and, and, and pride to be part of this uh, readings. And thank you for having in, on, on count these other languages, uh, maybe not uh, power languages, but also I think uh, interesting languages since also poetry is a minorized language as well. Um, usually I, I live uh, by the sea in, in A Coruña, in Galicia, by the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean in that case. But uh, today I'm uh, spending some time here in, in Andalusia, much closer to the Mediterranean. And in fact, I will start with this uh, poem that I read, in fact, very close to the Mediterranean. So I will start uh, sharing with you some, some calamari, some squid, okay. just as a starter or appetizer. In my case, I will be reading in Galician, which is uh, one of the four official languages in, in the Spanish state, um, with more speakers than Slovenian, by the way, uh, but also a stateless language as Bengali in India. So I, I feel uh, a lot of um, connections and, and complicity with my, my colleagues. I will read first in, in Galician this uh, squid. Calamar. Baixote un medio favorito. Nada un banco de respuestas. As tuas convicciones, nenas, dormen con peixes. O que se sustenta na pluma brilla canto máis negro é o seu redor. Polo menos, ti empregarías toda esa tinta con máis talento. As algas transparentes agárranse a un motivo molusco. A vergonza é un calamar. Con medo, escureceo todo. E ten demasiadas patas. Squid. Under your favorite element, a shoal of answers floats. While all your girlish notions are swimming with the fish. Everything that clings through the pen pours darkness. You, at least, would make better use of this ink. The seaweed limpet clings to its, convic its convictions. Shame is a squid. It scuttles behind everything and has far too many legs. I will follow with uh, some kind of indications about how to read poetry. So, como leer poesía. Tombada sobre area, duas horas na praia, ata que as miñas escápulas encastan co horizonte. Todos os puntos seguido que escribín na miña vida son mil menos ca os graíños sobre os que tendo a toalla. Dende aquí puedo ver cumes, toldos, metas, tellados sobre os que as rulas fan prácticas de bo. A oreal sain lleno verán para soles como a espullas, en oceo as nubes bobas, onde vai una, van todas. Boca arriba sobre area, estudo a mellor postura para que nada me expulse de esta voz extraterrestre. Un leve xiro de cabeza ha de poder ser abondo, o ceo é mellor non míralo nunca de fronte. Pecha sempre ollo ao que lle toca estar arriba. Fai que o teu propio nariz sexa quen de tapar o astro, pero mantén a outra córnea enfocada e ben alerta, suxeita firme o libro, muda a doito de postura. As barrigas dos bes han acabar por flotar nas ondas, protexe a pel, destapa o resto, deixa que as palabras remonten os seus propios símbolos. Non intentes traducir, 
o son que fan las bobinas. That was uh, an ideal poem for the beach now that we are, or I am so close to the beach now. I, I won't read the translation into English th since I think it is available for everybody, but I will follow with um, a poem that speaks also about language with many of these poems here, uh, considering that language is, is that bridge that unites us with others. But the pass of that bridge or the passing of that bridge is not always uh, straight, but sometimes narrow, very widening and with obstacles sometimes. But this other poem speaks about language and the use of language in the media. So I will read it first in Galician. Or maybe I can read it directly in English. Yes, why not? So this is the voice of the times. The croissants this morning are already off, while the papers on the table aren't to my taste. If only seeing could be undone. If only the times would last past breakfast. We step back from the lip syncing from choreographed interviews. No more truth like slaps, but truth like open palms. The headlines make for great music, sending you into the day shaped by predictive text. The most convincing news I read is catching my potato peels. So much of this information should be written off. It's only the truth will enslave you. Now also speaking about those uh, lapsus lingue. So this would be the perfect moment to apologize for my, for, for my bad English, my poor English. I'm so sorry, but I try my best. So this, this poem is called uh, Seek, S-I-C. Non entres a ese lugar, vestíbulo da boca, bóveda palatina, piso bucal, istmo das fauces, baixo as amígdolas, residuos de migallas de lenguas mortas, mapas tatuados nas mucosas, alguna rata roendo, tras da dobra sol lingual o de miurgo da sintaxe, intestinos orais de glutinduas sonoras, o sabernos do corpo, a caída da voz. Onde, os coi, onde escoitaches alegría, quixen decir alegoría. Onde criches que dicía presa, estaba querendo dicir presa. Cando sentiches sagrada, referíame a sangrada. Onde me escoitaches deu, deus, quería decir adeus. Sick. No entry beyond this point, the mouth's anteroom, the soft palates vault, oral accommodation, isthmus of the jaws, under the tonsils, the livings of dead tongues, maps tattooed on the mucus, errata knowing away, the artifice of syntax, across the sublingual fold, oral insights, devouring sounds, the bodily torment, the voices fall. When you heard glory, I meant to say allegory. When you got, I was hurried, I was actually hurried. When you heard believing, I was on about bleeding. And when you heard God, I was saying, gone. Wonderful, lovely, beautiful. I will, I will now read, uh, just in case someone watching is, uh, can, can, can uh, speak uh, some Spanish or, or enjoys some Spanish, I can read the next one 
uh, translated into Spanish. The title so, is Listen and Repeat Un Pajaro Una Barba. Todo el cielo está en cuclillas, una sed intransitiva. Hablar en una lengua ajena se parece a ponerse ropa prestada. Elga confunde los significados de país y paisaje. ¿Qué clase de persona serías en otra lengua? Tú me haces notar que a veces este instrumento mío de cuerda vocal desafina. En el patio de luces del lenguaje se me engancha la prosodia en el vestido. Te contaré algo sobre mis problemas con la lengua. Hay cosas que no puedo pronunciar, como cuando te veo sentado y solo veo una silla, ceci ne pas en chaise, una cámara oscura se proyecta en el hemisferio. Pronunciar si el poema es un exorcismo, un cambio de agregación, algún humor solidifica para abandonarnos. Así es la fonación la entalpía, pero tienes toda la razón, mi vocalismo deja mucho que desear, si dejo de mirar a tus dientes no voy a entender nada de lo que hables, el cielo se hace pequeño, Elga sonríe en cursiva y yo aprendo a diferenciar entre una barba y un pájaro más allá de que levante el vuelo si trato de atraparla entre las manos. So that will sound in English more or less like this. Listen and repeat. Un pajaro, una barba. The whole sky is hunched, an intransitive thirst. Talking a foreign language is like wearing borrowed clothes. Helga confuses the words for land and landscape. Who would you be in another tongue? You show me my vocal cord is at times off key. In the back garden of language, it's the prosody that snacks my dress. I'll tell you something about the problems with language. There are things I just can't wrap my mouth around. Like when I see you sat, and all I see is a seat. Ceci ne pas en chaise. A camera obscura beams on the hemisphere. Pronounced, if the poem is an exorcism, a change of state, some humor takes shape to escape from us. That's phonation, enthalpy. But yes. You're absolutely right. My delivery leaves much to be desired. If I'm not watching your teeth, I won't understand the word you say. The sky shrinks. Helga smiles in italics. And I learn the difference between a bird and a beard. And not just what takes off when I try to hold it in my hands. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Mm, I will read only in uh, English uh, the poem Recycling that says, and the quicksilver gone from the mirror. From the hand feeling for the trace, I make the best of jaded pages, the black ink from the flip side shows, and I think this could also be writing, scribbling new words while other early words seep through the page. And just to finish, I will not read the translation, but also only in Galician. Uh, thank you, thank, giving thanks again for all your kind attention. This poem that is called Que dor, ador que de veras sente. Teño cara de gustarme as cousas que non me gustan. Os labios de toda xente falan sen despegarse. 
Isto tamén é así. As paredes dunha gruta na que alguén hai cen mil anos desdoura o natural da pedra. Moedas, corrente alterna, unha rapaza nada cos xenes da beleza toda picada de complexos. Coma un orgasmo de Hedy Lamar os ollos de Nikola Tesla. Un país onde non ser, onde só compre, parecelo. Luvas desenfundadas sal a máis prestigiosa de todas as escolas de dobraxe. O capital é o pesadelo de quedarmos atoados na nosa capacidade simbólica. A máis favorecedora de todas, maquillaxe tanatoestética. Anos de traballos voltos un pedazo de granito ecuestre, unha industria da miseria ás leiras do volframio. Como un corpo ardente que sabe e disimula. Pestanas postizas de marca barata, unha imaxe idéntica a si mesma. Como a poesía política que se confunde cun selfie fronte ao espello do baño, a metonimia do mal, normativo dislocado. Estenificación menúa escaleira de incendios do discurso, algo ao que lle medran raíces aéreas e de vez por volver a terra en canto hai tempo que saiu a luz, como aos ollos das patacas. A ollada do poema é tamén así, filas de formigas obreiras esmagadas para permanecer, restos de acenos que parecen Outra cousa. Thank you so much. Muitas gracias. Yes, indeed. The last two words was translated into English was something else. So it was something else, actually. Uh, Yolanda, it was, it's a real treat to hear you again because uh, so much of your poetry also, in addition to the fact that it's written on the page, relies on the sonics of articulation that is reading it aloud. And the fact that you uh, collaborate with musicians and uh, other artists is, uh, is an obvious extension of that. Tell us, tell us uh, before that, I must tell you that the translations uh, of the poems are really, really good. Did you, did you work closely with the translator yourself? I think uh, one of the, the strong points is that the, the translations are made by a poet. As you yes. know, it's always very interesting. And an Irish poet, uh, is it Keith? Keith Payne, exactly. yes. the Irish poet Keith Payne, that happens to live in Galicia now. So oh, he's okay. uh, fluent in Galician and in, in uh, English, but he also has such a good taste that, of course, being uh, on his hands are uh, the best choice. He was he brought out beautifully the play of idiom in your you know all all your idiom about ink and thought and throwing away and flowing away. I just thought it's great. You've had a real dialogue. What who translates between Galician and Castilian, or do you do that? I do that because I'm I'm of course like bilingual it. as as uh, every Galician. Uh, of course, uh, we have two official languages in Galicia: uh, Galician plus Spanish, because we belong to the Spanish state. So we are, we have a decent command on on a Spanish. Let's say, on always I I, I always need um, some review, of course, because sometimes we have some biases as Galician uh, Spanish speakers but I can, I can do it myself. So I, the mistakes are, are mine. <laughs> I'm sure there are no mistakes, but that's very interesting because, you know, here in Wales, as you probably know, we have two languages and Wales is not really a state. It's historically a state. And um, most Welsh language poets don't translate themselves into English, although they are fully bilingual, they... I don't know what it is. It's a kind of sense of surrendering to a different tradition, a different era, something. I know that uh, there are those two options. And, and in fact, I have many uh, friends, the, the Galician poets that reject to self-translate. 
you know, to, 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 to reject the, the self-translation. Um, I think uh, you must choose is an option. Uh, of course, it, it can have also political impl implications, as I think you are suggesting somehow. But um, in my in my case, uh, it's it's an uh, create uh, an exercise that is uh, creatively speaking quite interesting and rewarding for me. I am uh, myself a, a literary translator as well, and and I enjoy it. So why not? Uh, yeah, facing the the writing of my own poem into uh, another language that I I can speak and and write. Maybe then before I shut up, um, a last question. Is that because actually the Castilian and the, the Spanish Castilian, what you won't want to say, and the Galician contemporary poetry traditions are quite similar? Because I think one of the reasons Welsh language poets don't do that uh -huh. is because the traditions are quite different. Uh, in fact, uh, while our languages, of course, have... Um, a good number of, of point, things in common because uh, uh, both uh, came from Latin, also like Catalan or Italian, as you know. Uh, but the tradition, the literary traditions are quite different. Uh, quite different, yes. So um, you cannot consider Galician literature as a, a, a kind of branch of a Spanish literature, not at all, mm -hmm. because we are a very ancient uh, literary tradition coming from 12th century, a little bit uh, elder than Spanish, in fact, more connected with Portuguese. Uh, and in fact, we were the same language in the beginning in the Middle Ages, uh, Portuguese and Galician, we were uh, with all those troubadours and all that. So the mm -hmm. traditions are quite different, That that is that is true. And that that can be uh, one of the, the the reasons why. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Very interesting. To, yeah. Thank you. I want to come back to the question which uh, I was alluding to earlier, which didn't get quite answered because we had an interesting conversation about language itself, which is about the sound. And the fact I've heard you read many times, of course, and um, you read beautifully, and there's a very performative, dramatic quality when you do read it. Um, but, and recently, uh, while preparing for this particular episode, I was also go have gone to the YouTube or, no, no, well, certainly on the net, and I heard you with this, this music band. Mm -hmm. And then I compared, I took two poems out, and then I compared your reading style when you're reading the poem just in a poetry reading context, and when you're reading the poem on stage with a band. And I saw these subtle variations, which is really, really interesting because you were in fact then marrying yourself with the other musicians on stage. Tell us a little bit about that because it's, it's, it's almost like jazz improvisation, but not quite that because you stick to the original text, of course, but you elongate your vowels and consonants in a way to suit whatever musician is behind you. Yes, of course. We ha I have been working with this musician that you uh, happen to see on, on the net uh, for 12 years. So we are quite uh, connected. And, and of course, and, and in fact, we have recorded a, a CD in, in, in Italy, by the way, in Italy, with all these uh, songs or but with poems and all that. My conception of poetry and my, my creative process has a lot to do with, with sound. And I am all the time very conscious that poetry was born not to be written, but to be said. <laughs> so uh, that oral, uh, that sound uh, um, aspect of poetry is very present for me all the time. Um, and I think is one of the strong, uh, strongest points of poetry that we can, in fact, perform it. And even I, I know some people that are not regular buyers, let's say, of, of poetry books, but they really enjoy readings, uh, poetry readings. We have a um, quite good tradition of poetry readings in Galicia. Maybe it's, in fact, connected with all that that I mentioned, the, the, the troubadours tradition coming from Middle Ages. Uh, so we are very conscious that poetry is also to be shared and performed in front of an audience. Uh, this is uh, nothing too modern, as, as you can see. 
uh, but it's uh, one of the, my favorite ways to enjoy poetry uh, with uh, readings. So I think it's something very connected with voice, uh, uh, of course, at the same time with body. So poetry is the language of body, the language uh, where uh, that is the most connected with, with body, but at the same time with, with uh, thought, of course, uh, intuition, and, and and all that. So it's it's like in the intercession of thought and body, uh, that is voice. Super, fantastic. You know, the wonderful thing and the frustrating thing about hosting these things is, you know, you have three wonderful people on show and actually you can make a whole program with each one of them because there's so much to talk about. And of course, these are poets, both Fiona and I know in different ways. Uh, over the years, so we have a deep connect with these poets' uh, work. So it's a wonderful melange of two sensibilities. Of course, both uh, Fiona and I are English language poets coming from entirely different traditions, and that's an interesting thing in any case. Alesh, on that note, you're on now, and um, it's great to have you, as I said, uh, offline, and I'll make it public again. You look just as young uh, as you were 20 years ago. Um, it goes back, I heard you first, I think in Vilenitsa, perhaps, uh, uh, the could festival. Be, be. Perhaps yes, even, yes. even more than 20 years ago. Maybe, 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 maybe even. Yes, we're not exactly all very young. Uh, no, some of us are, some people are. Um, where is Alesh? Yeah, there he is. Yes. So I'm going to, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing you read. Uh, um, I'm gonna read the bios, as you can see, it's uh, the poems and the bios, again, for uh, the rest of the audience, you can see that they're always on the chat box for people to follow. Um, a shorter version of Alesh's bio is yeah. also on the chat box. But let me introduce Alesh formally. Alesh Tagger is a poet and prose writer based in Ljubljana in Slovenia. His work has been widely translated among his many books is Above the Sky Beneath the Earth, which was published by White Pine Press in the US in 2019. And he'll be reading from that and all the poems in that particular book been translated from the Slovenian by Brian Henry, a wonderful, wonderful translator and a poet. Uh, he received the title Chevalier des Arts Letters from the French government and is a member of the Berlin Academy of Arts and the German Academy for language and literature. Um, his bio can stretch to 10 pages because you know uh, mm. everybody on, on the show is so accomplished. So I would just quickly say, go to www.aleshtega.com and you will be flooded with the riches and beauty <laughs> of this <laughs> planet. Alesh, what a treat Welcome. to have you. Welcome. Welcome. It, 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 it's a great, it's really a great honor, pleasure being with you. Um, I'll try to make it uh, similar to Yolanda. I'll switch um, between uh, English and, and Slovenian. Hopefully I won't be too long. Um, as uh, Shandip already mentioned, uh, all the poems you're gonna hear are from above the earth, uh, above the sky, beneath the earth, uh, translated by Brian, Brian Henry. Esteemed doctor of culture, birds fly beneath the roots. Computers are sweating, at the poles holes grow, and deaf mute people rush from inside them to scrape the sclera and shame from your eyes. Our names are proteins. We are happy when we burn them, cherished doctor, internationally ill expert on the manufacture of souls. Without a doubt, we are dialogic. Whoever doubts goes in the pit. Whoever doesn't doubt goes the only way. No doctrines. The time of salvation is already breathing down a dirty neck. The day arrives like a poem in a lost language. A barefoot girl is pricked by a forgotten word and gnashes her teeth. Ljubezen, 
Ljubezen je ljubezen. Ljubezen je mala mačica, mala mačica je ljubezen. Ljubezen je mala mačica, ki pije vodo iz počene skodele. Love, love is a, love is love, love, love is a, a small love, love is a small kitten drinking water from a cracked dish. Gospod je rekel gora. Padel je sneg in ga prekril. Gospod je priklical pomlad, da je pritekla iz gore. Gospod je izginil v vršičkih smrek. Na gladini je gorelo poletje. Gospod je gledal človeka, ki je umival v njem. O, e, je zašumel gospod. Koliko gospoda mora preteči, da se očisti en sam človek? The Lord said mountain, snow fell and covered the Lord. The Lord called spring, and it came running out of the mountain. The Lord disappeared into the tops of pines. Summer blazed on the surface of the lake. The Lord watched the man who bathed himself in the Lord. Oh, hey, murmured the Lord. How much? of the Lord has to pass by so that one solemn man becomes purified. Mm. Mati moja, ki si v telesih, razdejanje je tvoje ime. Pridi vsaj k meni, v tvoje izgnanstvo, zgodi se tvoje nasilje, v revščini in izobilju. Navrzi vsaj danes kakšno puhlo droptino in odpusti mi trenutke šipkosti, ko poskušam ukrasti življenjo več, kot nameniš. Ne odpeli me ponovno v praznino. Naj se zdrobe moje kosti, ko me pobožaš, mati. My mother, who art in bodies, devastation is your name. Come to me, at least, in your exile, your brutality occurs in poverty and plenty. Toss today at least a worthless crumb and forgive me my moments of weakness when I try to steal more from life than you intended. Don't lead me once more into emptiness. May my bones be crushed when you caress me, mother. Milk turns to ash, history to oblivion. A deer eats wheat in the garden of my dead mother. Mleko gre v pepel, zgodovina v pozabe. Crna je plevel, 
cu vârtul moe matere. Nico creu pe peu, zgodovina u pozabe, srna je pleveu u vrtul moje mrtve matere. Mleko creu pe peu, zgodovina u pozabe, srna je pleveu u vrtul moje mrtve. Vsakdo od nas je od nekot. Vsakdo ne nehno prihaja od nekot. Ne bomo nehali prihajati, peti, biti vsakdo. Zvezde, reke, gore, so nezanesljivi orijentir. Le kar noseš, kar ne moreš nehati nositi sabo, ko prihajaš in prihajaš. Ne nehno, le to je, le to. Edini kraj. Vse je ostalo od nekot, vsakdo, nekam. Hvalje na bodi, nedoločljiva in svobodna smer, naše poti. Every one of us is from somewhere. Everyone is endlessly arriving from somewhere. We'll never stop arriving, singing, being everyone. Stars, rivers, mountains are unreliable orientation. Only what you carry, what you cannot stop carrying inside yourself when you're arriving and arriving endlessly It is only this, only this, the only place. Everything from somewhere, everyone, someplace. You'll be praised, the undefinable and free course of our path. I have a white shirt. In the middle of the night, a dark body glows in it. White is the border. I live here. I'm spoken over there. I have a white, snowy, angelic shirt. I raise the color, unfasten a button, roll up a sleeve. Language gets dirty. The angel gets dirty. The soul gets dirty. But I still live in my snowy clean, in my perfectly white shirt. Belo srajco imam, sredi noči žari v njej, temno ne telo. Bela je meja. Tukaj prebivam, tam me govori. Belo, snežno, angelsko srajco imam. Dvignem ovratnik, odpnem gumb, spodviham rokav. Umaže se jezik, umaže se angel, umaže se duša. Jaz pa še zmeraj v moji snežno čisti, v čisto beli srajci prebivam. Like a virgin forest, we too have become coal. You, who goes into yourself, remember the echoes. Whoever digs into time enters eternity. A person is a shadow thrown by a letter. The letter goes everywhere. The shadow doesn't leave the cave. A person, a person 
is a person. A person is a shadow thrown by a person. A person is a shadow thrown by a letter. A person is a shadow thrown by a letter. The letter goes everywhere. The shadow doesn't leave the person. A person is a shadow. A person is a shadow thrown by a letter. The letter goes everywhere. The letter goes everywhere. A person, a person is a shadow thrown by a letter. The letter goes everywhere. The shadow doesn't leave the cave. I think I could conclude here. Thank you. Okay. How wonderful, brilliant, fantastic. Uh, Alish, I have immediately a couple of uh, observations. Um, um, of course, the similar, similarity between you and y Yolanda is the way you read in the sort of very breathy, echoey kind of way. And uh, you use these silent uh, spaces quite actively in your readings. Um, but your, your poems are both um, at one level biblical, and Surrealist, but what is very, very interesting because you know you present it in a very serious way, but there is there's a lot of humor in your poetry to to a discerning eye or an ear. Yeah. Tell us uh, tell us about that because I think it's very, very difficult to inject humor, and I know this from you know I've asked so many poets this. You know we are all so terribly serious that yeah. it's very, very difficult to write in a sort of funny manner, but still be serious at the same time. Do talk about that aspect. But first of all, I would like to say uh, there are really many uh, parallels between what Yolanda was talking about her work and, and my work, because I was also in the last couple of years, even more intensively than before. I was collaborating with many um, musicians and making appearances and it it somehow gave new life to my, my work. Um, you're completely right. I think humor is the, uh, some. I mean, it's, you cannot write humor on purpose, I think, if, if, if the humor is truly good. I think, or at least I don't have this gift. Humor appears as the only solution when nothing uh, else is there, there to remain. It's the only way how to write it in order to sustain, to bring something over, over the abyss to the other side. Um, some 10 years ago, after I've published a couple of books of poetry, I fell in a state of mind where, where I thought that it really has no, how shall I say, no sense, no real sense to go on writing because there is so much beautiful poetry in the world. Why adding something to this beauty which is out there? So I stopped and it worked very well for one, two years and then suddenly poems started to appear in my ear and I wanted to chase them away. I wanted to say, go away, I don't need you. But they kept returning. So there was a very, how shall I say, they were like earworms. I couldn't get rid of them basically. And that's, that's how many of the poems from that book happened. And after this book came out, I started to perform them together, as I already mentioned, with the accordion player. And being on stage, telling them aloud, brought another dimension to it. And there, I think, I didn't catch the humor that you mentioned, because you are such a sharp reader. I didn't, me myself, I didn't catch the, this, this, this thin layer of humor, which is many times inserted as clearly as when I started to interpret uh, with a musician these poems. And this humor came through this dialogue between sound and, and, and word and movement, as Yolanda said very correctly. Uh, I mean, the, the body somehow brings out the, the, the humor out of the language. It's, it's funny to say, but 
I mean, Rabelais was completely right. I mean, it's this bodily aspect that has to come to poetry when you want to have humor. And you get it much more, of course, on stage than behind a typewriter or behind, you know, um, any kind of screen. Chaucer, Chaucer as well, perhaps. Yeah. I was really struck too, and thank you for an absolutely beautiful reading, Alish. And thank you, Yolanda, too, who I didn't get a chance to thank. Um, so, as Shadeep says, it's kind of the silence of the pause is so beautifully held. But I was struck both by the kind of the humor and the music, the physicality, the silence is physicality too, but also this sense of kind of deep thinking and the short poems when you're riffing and you're going back into them and you're repeating in them, you're playing with words. I was wondering how, like a pack of cards that shuffles meaning for you. Yeah. How shall I say? It's like, you know, it's like trying to interpret against the poem. Oh. It's like trying to destabilize a field which is very fixed in my mind. Mm. Because these very short poems, they're, they work in a way like definitions, something that I came up, uh, it's, to me, it seems almost by chance, but in fact, you know, it's my life that stands behind that. Mm. And it's very hard when you have such short, short, um, he heavy sentences there. It's very hard as an interpreter to, to, to keep up with them somehow, to give, mm. them, give them space. So it's like I'm having a big rock and I'm trying to all kinds of tricks to move it somehow, to see what is beneath again and again, hmm. probably not successful, but, but still it's, it's, um, it's, it's a movement this is, uh, that is not, how shall I say, uh, it's purely improvised. It's nothing that I prepare. It comes automatically. Sometimes I do it, sometimes not. And it's always something else. And, and it helps and, us as listeners not to skate over the top of how profound what you're saying is. It helps us hear the weight of this big rock that you're moving. In fact, I'm not moving it. I'm only dancing around. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, yes, yes. I, you know, this, this is this whole idea of silence. I, I, I also like a lot of the self-referential sort of I'm, I'm going to bring it back to humor, but it's actually not humor, it's wit. You know, you, you talk know about the dark and the white, you talk about absence and opulence, uh, and then the way you were playing with white and the white shirt, that poem itself, and I visually when I'm looking at that, that's, that has its own poetry because it's a conscious act, isn't it? When you're reading a poem and the kind of color palette you are perhaps not accidentally in this case, or perhaps uh, intentional, that also plays up. Uh, but, you know, you talk, talking about the riffs, which, um, because I think the other thing that unites all the poets here is music and musicality. And when you were reading your shorter poems, I understand that you have to say, repeat the line, repeat half the lines, um, as a fade out, as an echo, because you need to hold the, the oral attention of yeah. the listener, because it's too fast, it's too quick. It's like reading a haiku on stage. And it's very difficult to read short poems on stage when you're yeah. performing, which is why when you are collaborating with musicians, they ironically, of course, like very short poems because they can compose it and then can repeat it and they can do refrains yeah. and they don't want long poems in my experience when I work with musicians. Um, um, you're, you're, completely, you're completely right. I think um, if you look at texts used in, in even the best songs, the songs we like most, we see how little text there is, you know, because it's... Um, Poets, we would we would like to very often we would like to d deliver something to, to the audience, but in doing so, we are over overdoing it. But coming back to 
to, to your um, to your notion of humor, I think also there is something in East, Central and Eastern European literature, not only in in poetry but also in prose, which is very specific. It's it's a very deeply rooted black humor. I know Fiona knows it inside out. I mean, it's something it. that also it's very hard somehow for readers from other continents, other traditions to, 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 to get uh, acquainted with, because it's, it's very, I mean, it's very near to a deadly humor, uh, very near to extreme traumatic experiences, which are being then turned uh, upside down. Uh, and the, I mean, exorcism was was the word of that Yolanda used so beautifully in one of her poems. Uh, it, it's perhaps you know that we, with humor, we try to be exorcists of very traumatic um, things that occurred not only in the past that are reoccurring, reoccurring all over again, and it's just um, a, a tiny a tiny, uh, how shall I say, window through which we try to escape, not with our bodies, not with our faith, but at least with, with a poem or a line. I have such a strong sense of you, as you say, dancing around in both senses, also history and culture, philosophy, religion, I mean you are constantly returning to or Plato, the cave, or Christian iconography, and it's, it's utterly built into the kind of, well, the trajectory of a poem, but what you're trying to work out, the, the thisness of your poems. I won't say the world, or I won't say the idea, but the kind of, that reality. It's a stunning thing to do. Hmm. It's um, also Fantastic. a question. I mean, we all are tending to become very globalized and uh, we are less and less bound to national traditions, which I think is a good thing. But still, there are very specific um, um, things that, that hold us uh, there where, where we are grounded. And uh, it's, it's a big question how to, how to create a space of understanding for these particularities of, of uh, of what we inherited basically and what yeah. we cannot uh, uh, avoid somehow in our writing. Maybe it's one of the things we try in Conclave too, that sense of a polyphony, lots of different voices, but not arguing with each other. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I think, I think that the word inheritance is a good segue uh, point uh, because um, before uh, Nandana, starts a reading, I think it would be fairly appropriate to maybe dedicate, if I have everybody's permission to do that, dedicate uh, this particular episode, this session, to two very, very fine poets, who are, one who's just passed away recently, and the other is the person who's going to be featured after this uh, just now. Of course, Nobunita Dev Chen, who'll be, whose poetry uh, her daughter will be reading, and she died a few years ago. And very recently, we lost one of the finest European poets, the Estonian poet Jan Kaplinski. Yeah. So perhaps it's uh, a fitting to say dedicate this uh, because we have we are very lucky to have inherited the sort of riches they've left, and we are just like conduits in in a sense, you know, carrying on and inventing and reshaping different traditional and traditions. That That's were... a beautiful thing to say. Thank you, Shadik. Can I just say something quickly then about Kaplinsky, who was a friend of mine and whom I translated. I translated two of his books. And um, um, I suppose all I want to say about him is that um, he really understood the forest. And when he came to stay with me in Wales, his relationship with the Welsh forest, which is utterly different in its, its symbolism and in, indeed in its flora, from the Estonian forest, but was very um, touching and really um, interesting. He famously cut down a, a pine tree outside my house and took down the power cables with it, having told me, <laughs> oh, I know all about how to cut trees and I know which way this tree will fall. But um, there was something very, and I think 
in a way this speaks to the Galician and the Slovenian experience too. There's something about small countries that get pushed to the edge of what it's the part of Europe that sees itself as the mainstream that he really understood. And he had a kind of patience with the quiet experiences. He, used to, he talked about in one of his poems about Estonia, a serious grayish Estonia. And he had a lot of patience with the small, the serious, the grayish sometimes countries, which certainly Wales was. Um, despite the fact that he also, you know, worked on a big stage and was there nobilizable and was, you know, a politician and so on. You know, and also, you know, he was born part Jewish in 1941 in Tartu, not a great, you know, start in life. So, yeah, wonderful man. So thank mm. you, Shadeep. Yeah, pleasure. So finally, we now move to Nobonita Dev Shen. And I'm going to be pronouncing it in pure Bengali, uh, because that's really how it sounds like my name Sudeep Sen as you read it is really Shudeep Shane because we, we have three S's and we use a particular S mostly when we write it. Uh, and um, a, a quick, quick um, sort of reader, if you know any of the Dravidian or the Indic languages, say Hindi certainly, which is a big language, Bengali certainly is too is uh, when we utter our vowels, A-E-I-O-U, in Bangla, which is the actual word for Bengali, Bing Bengali is just an anglicized version of what Bangla should be. We open our mouths, this is what my mother taught me to explain to non-Bengali <laughs> readers or people, we open our mouths vertically more for every vowel. So it's, if it's in English, it's A-E-I-O-U, we'll say O A. E, E. In Hindi, it's A, A, E, E, U, U, and so on. Uh, Navanita Dev Shen was uh, a, a great inspiration for me because when I came back from America after finishing my post-graduation, uh, I was a young poet, uh, barely in my early 20s, and she was leading a workshop of poetry at the National Academy in Delhi, and uh, somehow took to my poetry. I didn't know her except from a distance as a sort of figure in um, the Indian literary firmament. And then that started the relationship. And then quite accidentally over the years, I've got to know some of their children really well. And it's such a treat that her daughter, you know, translates her poetry. And um, so let me just formally read out the bios. Um, it's also on the chat box on the side, but I'll read slightly shortened versions of the same. Nobonita Deb Shane, 1938 to 2019, is one of the most beloved, versatile, and prolific modern Bengali writers. She has authored over 100 books, including volumes of poetry, novels, plays, short stories, memoirs, academic essays, children's literature, political col columns, and literary translations. Educated at Presidency College and Jadupur University in Kolkata, and then at Harvard, Berkeley, Indiana Universities, Deb Shane lived a parallel life as a highly acclaimed international scholar and feminist, and a distinguished professor of comparative literature. Her many honors include the Padma Shri Sahitya Academy Award, Bangla Academy Lifetime Achievement Award, Big Little Book Award for Children's Literature, and Lifetime Achievement Award from the Publishers and Booksellers Guild. Nobunita Dev Shane was the founder and president of the West Bengal Women's Writers Association, SHOI. Nonduna Dev Shane, Nobunita's daughter and translator of Acrobat, which you see on the screen right now, and has just come out from Archipelago Press, uh, Archipelago Books, I'm sorry, uh, this year, uh, perhaps a few weeks ago actually, is an award-winning writer, actor, and child rights activist. She studied at Harvard University where she won the John Harvard Scholarship and Elizabeth Agassiz Prize each year. Um, and then filmmaking at the University of Southern California School of Cinema and Television. She is the author of six children's books, translated into 15 languages. 
She divides her time between India, England, and America. Hannah starred as a leading heroine in 20 feature films from four continents. So there's completely another side of this lady, a very, very glamorous side of this woman. Um, as an advocate and ambassador, she has represented the UNICEF, Operation Smile, RAHI, and the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights to fight against child abuse and to end human trafficking. Nondona is Child Protection Ambassador for Save the Children in India. Welcome, Nondona. It's a pleasure to have you. And it's so nice. And we use the word nice a lot in India and in Bangla to relive your mother's memory through her poetry. It's a so, nice word, nice. Welcome, well, Nandana. Welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, inviting all of us to be part of this very special conclave. I have to say I'm absolutely spellbound by the poetry and the translations that uh, we have been hearing today. And, you know, while I know Spanish, a bit and I'm familiar with the with the sound of uh, Portuguese, uh, Galician and uh, Slovenian are new languages to me and it was so um, joyful to be swept away in the in in their cadence so I'm, I have a lot of thoughts, questions, uh, observations for both the poets. If there's time afterwards, I'd love certainly. Or I'd love to to do that. Um, but I wanted to say for now that I'm really grateful to be here. I'm grateful to the two of you, Sudeep and uh, Fiona, for curating this really transformative series, and to Don for taking care of everything and making it all seamless behind the scenes, and. All my thanks to all of you who have joined us, I see from four time zones. Um, this is absolutely incredible. And you know, in a time of intense isolation and anxiety, it is just so wonderful to feel connected um, and united through poetry. My mother frequently wrote and spoke about the fact that she felt poetry was a vital necessity for freedom and also for, for unity. And I, I feel that today's gathering is a truly marvelous uh, illustration of that. Ma used to love Kobi Shomelons. Kobi Shomelon is what we in Bangla, uh, it basically means a poetry meet, a, a, a poetry um, conclave like this one. In fact, Shudip and I met for the first time in a, in a, in a Kobi Shomelon in Jaipur Lit Fest. Um, and you've met my mother in various Kobishon Milans, of course. So what I thought I would do, she would have loved to have been here. She loved uh, international translating international poetry as well. That was one of her huge uh, passions as a poet. But I would love to read some of the poems that she loved to read in Poetry Meets. And I'm going to begin and end with um, Bengali. Madari. Bebeche, she buchi kuk shundor madari khala jane. Du hate shomoy ke niye lopha lupi, akon, tokon. Du toi na chabe, du muchote. Hete jabe dorir opore, bebeche, she shop kichupari. Jibone agbari shudhu, dori, kepe ote. Acrobat. She thought she knew acrobatics rather well, that she could juggle time with both hands, play with the now right next to the then. She would make both dance, she thought, fist to fist, and she would glide so smooth along the tightrope. She thought she could do absolutely anything at all. Only once in your life will the rope shiver. Jotokal kobitai. Beche thako, pute thako. Amok passport chobi hoye, protek line tumi jege thako. Akonto teshtar moto, chati phata jantrona amar, pute thako. Lukiye theko na. Jotokal kobitai bachi. In poetry, stay alive. Show yourself clearly like an unfailing passport photo. Stay awake in every line, you, 
like an unquenchable thirst. Yes, you, the pain that tears my heart apart. Show yourself clearly like a flower in full bloom. Don't hide from me as long as I live in poetry. Alphabet bird. When night falls, I search for him. I bring him home. I look him in the eye and I cage language. When day breaks, once again, the world wraps around my eyes and off he flies, taking each word, that alphabet bird. I have to say, Alice, that one of your poems reminded me uh, a bit of this one, you know, the, in the one where you say, you talk about the poem that nests, the poem that nests in my head, is it really mine? Um, Broken home. Once again, you glow on the brink of love. Once again, you're dazzling in heartbreak. Is it for the sake of poetry then that once again you're hunting for pain? Do you break your home just for poetry time and again? Take back the night, man. In the twilight, I could still hear the lark, woman. The night was moonless, oppressively dark, man. In the flowering woods, a night fairy walked, woman. In the sundarbans, the man-eater stalked, man. In that fragrant springtime air, woman. Blood-drenched remains lay there. Mm. Growing up lesson. Boy, are you scared of bloodshed? Are you terrified of plucking virginity? If the taste of blood goes to your head, do you fear that it will be a calamity? The truth is, whether wrong or right, your blood calls out to you each night. Listen, boy, it's time for you to grow. Words can be as fierce, don't you know? The treachery that lingers on tongue tips beyond the world that all your dreams show, know that blood can be easily shed by lips. Mm. Lovely. Unspoken. Each time you say forever, forever, I only hear today, today. Yeah. Uh, this is a longer poem, so we're going to share the screen um, with you. And it's a poem that my mother wrote about my grandmother, who was also a, a beloved poet, Radharani Devi. Um, and this is a poem that my mother wrote a few years after my grandmother passed away. The Lamp, Memories on My Mother's Birthday. Go to sleep now, Ma, it's way past 11. 11? It's still early then, but you must go to bed. You're teaching tomorrow. Ma sits in her easy chair, thick glasses perched on her thin nose, pale fingers clutching her magnifying glass. The statesman spread out across her lap. Next to her on the table, her flask of tea, her medicines, her fragrant beetle leaf in its silver case, her brass spittoon, her cash box. Behind her on the teapoy, an earthen vase filled with her favorite white tube roses and a wicker table lamp weaved in agartala. Before her, the alarm clock ticking away, her traveling timepiece. As Ma turns the pages of the newspaper, its noisy crackle splinters the quiet night. Closing my book, I come to her. As soon as I step inside, I drown in the deep perfume of those tube roses. The nurse is dozing in her chair. Ma, please go to sleep now, it's 
1.30, she scolds. And you're still awake? Don't you have college tomorrow? Swallowing the rebuke, I keep on wheedling. You'll get sick, Ma, if you stay up like this. You must take care of your body. My body? Ma breaks into laughter that sparkles like jewelry shimmering from head to toe. How much more sick can it get? And what uses my body anyway? I go to her one more time before I sleep. It's 2.30, Ma. Do call it a night. Come, let me take you to your bed. Yes, I'm coming, just coming. There's only this one tiny bit left. Reading isn't so easy now, you see. It's the gift of these cataracts. With a slight smile, embarrassed, apologetic, she buries herself again in printed words. Under the glowing light of the table lamp, with her focus on the magnifying glass, the ticking of the alarm clock fades away. As I walk back to my room, I hear her speaking softly to the nurse. No, no, my dear, don't turn out that light. Keep that lamp switched on, please. I have just one more page left. Just one more page left. One more paragraph. One more sentence. Give me one more word, dear nurse. Just one more day. I'm going to um, bring back the music of Bangla um, in this uh, very short poem, which is written with a very particular uh, rhyming scheme and uh, metrical pattern, which I think, I hope you will be able to hear both in English and in Bangla. You can see on the page that uh, they oc occupy space in the same way. I feel quite strongly about how, about the shape a poem has on the page. Um, and uh, you have a way of comparing the two. Bhalo basha baro. তুমি চেয়েছিলে নিরুপাধি প্রেম অনধিগম্য আমি গেঁথে আনি লবঙ্গলতা তোমারই জন্য তুমি বুঝি চাও প্রেমের বাতাস নাতিশীতোষ্ণ আমি বইয়ে দি কাল বৈশাখী ভয়াল কৃষ্ণ তোমার প্রণয় প্রযুক্ত নয় দূর বিশুদ্ধ আমার প্রণয় কিছুটা প্রণয় কিছুটা যুদ্ধ out of reach. You asked for a nameless love, out of reach. I weaved you a wreath of blooms, each to each. You want love's tempered breeze, softly sighing. I blow you a dark thunderstorm, terrifying. Your love is detached, afar, chased to its core. My love is in part love and in part war. Um, face to face. There are one or two faces whose eyes I can't bear to meet. When I stand before them, I feel I forgot to brush my teeth or wipe away the traces of dirt from my cheek. Because some loving faces shine just like a mirror I can see me in them vividly, closer than even myself and clearer. Sometimes love. It comes when called, like a pet cockatoo, it sits on my finger, fluttering. It sways its neck, fluffs its feathers, swings its crest, and recites its practiced lines, uttering, every pleasing word. My lily white bird repeats to me all that it's been taught and sings best. Saying just what I want to hear, it pours honey into my ear. But behind my back, soon after, alone perched on its base, my lily white bird clatters its shiny shackles as it cackles with laughter, shedding feathers in empty space.
make up your mind. Make up your mind. Who do you want? That woman or me? Within me breathe two people. Make up your mind. Who do you want? That woman or me? Mm. Coming to the last uh, two poems. Um, this one, the doctor was also one that my mother wrote for my grandmother just um, a few, uh, few days before my grandmother passed away. The doctor. Like a phantom guarding the hidden treasures of half a century, her two clenched hands hold in their grasp the unconditional promise of asylum. After all these years, the knot is loosening. Released from the ties, one will pass over to the other side, leaving the other a prisoner on this. From the moment of birth, the auspicious exchange of glances sealed the bond. That ever familiar face grows gradually indistinct. A light from beyond flashes upon it, changing its pallor as the vortex of pain spins into a mighty whirlwind, pulling into its twist, 50 years of anger, sorrow, frantic, distraught love. Will the umbilical cord be cut now at last? Has the doctor finally arrived? The last one um, is actually one of my mother's most iconic poems. Uh, and uh, I could read it um, just in Bangla, since you can read, look at the translation as we are short of time, or should I read it in both? Uh, Shudip and Fiona, what do you think? It's your call. Yeah, it's your call. But I think just, it, it would be lovely to finish with Bangla, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, just read it in Bangla, yeah. Okay, great. Ekal chirokal. Hamko mita sakenge zamana me dam nahi ghalib. Amake nebate pare, ato shokti rakhe na shomoy. Kakono bhebona, ami shomoyer mukche thaki. Shomoy amar shonge khele jak, juddho juddho khela. Jotui karuk shari, lodja bostro thik thake baki. Montro bale, bala hoye jabe shob, jachilo obala. Dharmo juddhe, protibadi chirokal dhanay nirbhoy. Jehetu shapak khetar, Ishar Shadito Mohakal, Shoyong Sharuti Hoe, Shab Buho Bhangen Uttal, Jotui Dikna Jutto, Kondokal Hobe Parajito, Eito Genechi Shastre, Jotutuku Hoeche Udhito, O Kondokalir Poko Pat Dono Ami Mohashoe, Amake Ranga Pichok, Atoshukti, Rakina Shuman. Thank you. Thank you marvelous, so much, Nandana. Thank you. And that must have been very difficult to do also. It was, uh, it was difficult to do, Fiona. Um, do you mean this poem or do you mean the book? Both, actually, and I meant the reading too. Oh. You know, because you're speaking your mother's words, although they're your words because they're your translations. Yes. That's a um, difficult thing to do. It, it is, and it's, you know, we were supposed to work on this book together and we signed uh, the contract for this book um, just two weeks before she died. Okay. So it ended up being my project, um, you know, and, and then, then lockdown happened just within a month after that, um, within a couple of months after that. So then I worked on it on my own, but as you said correctly, with every poem, I could actually hear her voice and you know, not just sort of uh, physically, I could physically hear it. So it was difficult, um, but in a way, I think it was, uh, it's difficult to write a book like this while you're grieving, but in now that uh, the book is here, um, I can, I understand how also in some ways it definitely helped me get used to, not get used to, but cope with uh, the loss, definitely. So 
And I hope a sense of continuing dialogue too. Absolutely. It definitely felt like uh, it was a conversation that was going on. Uh, and every time I read from it, it feels that it feels like it feels like the, con the conversation is continuing. Um, I mean, that's a very astute observation, Fiona, so much so that that I was actually reluctant to finish the book because I didn't really want the conversation to end. Yeah, I can understand that. Yes. Well, thank you so much for sharing it with us, because I felt like we were kind of privileged to something quite intimate as well as, you know, the normal, as it were, normal literary virtues. Thank you. Hmm. So, I'll, I'll, yeah, no, no, that was beautiful, beautiful. And you read beautifully, of course, and every time you were, you were reading a poem, I, of course, remember the Bangla original and your yeah. mother's voice, because yeah. these poems are so, so familiar. And because she comes from a different generation, you know, the, the younger generation almost, we, we know a lot of the poems by heart. Right. We're still in that sort of old tradition where it's just wonderful to just, rem you know, learn poetry by heart and recite it regardless of... Um, just because the beauty of enunciation and the language and the music of the language is so important and critical in our particular, um, in the subcontinent, so to speak. But uh, I'll jump right into the translations themselves. Um, lots of thoughts. Um, I'll just touch upon one or two because, you know, as I said, with all these wonderful poets, we can have a program, individual program for all of you. But for instance, in the last poem, especially the poems you translated, which are metrically very, very tight mm -hmm. and uh, quite traditional, maybe in a sense, because mm -hmm. the sound, it's, it is a particular song. It is a particular kind of Bangla. It's a particular kind of literary Bangla. Exactly. Yet she is a modern poet. So when it's read out in a modern context, you um, orally and tonally go back into another era. But of course, the things she's talking about is very contemporary. So that balance, when done in Bangla within India or a Bengali community, you don't think about it so consciously because it's part of the osmotic DNA. But when I was reading the English, you clearly have taken certain decisions, uh, A to especially the rhyme metrical poems, um, to keep the rhyme scheme and the line lengths and so on. Mm -hmm. To me, I think it's a very, very difficult thing to do because when you're trying to do the English for a contemporary English reader, mm -hmm. you have to take a decision about the word usage. Do I faithfully translate the Bangla of that tone? Or do mm -hmm. I want to translate the content and so that it's relatable to a contemporary audience? Tell us about that, because I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I'm just, we are all curious about the sorts of decisions. I'd, I'd, I'd love to uh, get your thoughts on it, but yes, you're absolutely right. The particular point, the last point, since it's fresh in our memories, um, A Cultural Right Now Forever is written very much, as you said, in a classical, almost Rabindrik style. And uh, at the same time, and then she also uses uh, metaphors from our epics, like the big epic battle of Mahabharata, the, the ordeals that our classical heroines have gone through, Draupadi, and uh, she, their references um, to our archetypal uh, heroines. And yet it is also a poem that's very much about every woman. She makes it into a poem about every woman. Indeed, she makes it into a poet about, poem about herself. So it's a fascinating, uh, one of the reasons why I love this poem so much and the reasons why, one of the reasons why I think it is so iconic is because even in, it's she um, gave herself a lot of challenges in this poem. So she very consciously made a choice of following a metrical structure and a rhyme scheme that was quite uh, classical. She made a point of using a lot of arch archaic language as well as epic images and tropes. At the same time, she wrote it as a conversation. So, you know, uh, you know, she is speaking to uh, mm. a second person, person there. So it's also written as a dialogue. So there's a kind of familiarity in that address. Um, 
she also made up she was wonderful she was incredibly talented as a as a rhyme as a she was a magician with rhymes but she was also great at making up words so this word kondokal for instance you translated it it can be interpreted as a part of time or as part of the time or as uh Div so or divided time or as I, I chose to interpret it as divisive time because that uh, interpretation brought to the poem, to the translation, the nuance of contemporary uh, relevance that I felt it, it that the Bengali had and that needed to be injected into the English by the choices that you make. So, so this was a poem that like, I'm glad that we spoke about it. We, I, I wondered about whether or not I thought it would be an ambitious poem to translate, but because it is such a beloved poem of ours, I felt like I really needed to include that in this book. But How one of the things, sorry, just to follow on because it, it, it's relevant to this particular poem, you took, a fairly brave decision. I wonder what your ma would have said, because in the English translation, you dropped the very, very crucial epigraph from Ghalib. And the epigraph, in fact, for, uh, uh, anchors the, the context in a way, or is, is, is really the leaping off, a uh, leaping board for the poem and the argument that follows. But mm -hmm. in the English, you chose to leave it. And to me, Again, it's a choice you've made. I'm just again wondering why, because that I thought was so crucial in Bangla. Yeah, well, I actually did discuss that with Ma because this was on the list of, uh, so before we had started making a list of poems that uh, we would, that would go into Acrobat and that was at the top of the list. So, uh, because Ma had always loved this poem and had found it very, very difficult to translate. Mm -hmm. um, so I had asked her that because I, uh, the, the the challenge in that one is a is a practical one really so it wasn't a question of um i mean so we were and i've made a, i'll give you a few other examples where i've taken some liberties in the way you represent uh literature within her poetry for instance she has one poem called uh i give to base a life where she quotes a few lines from antony and cleopatra and I included those lines, but I actually didn't give the source because I found that it was a bit distracting. I thought it was important for those lines to be there, but the one of the things that I decided with this book was to not have any uh, footnotes. Just like the two kind of decisions that made uh, the translation process significantly diff more difficult uh, were one that I wanted to be true to the rhyming scheme and the metrical structure. Any poem that was written in, in rhyme, I wanted to render in rhyme. And the second thing was I did not want to give footnotes to in contextualize what was happening in the poetry. I would have to solve that challenge within the poem. Is That's a challenge that I set for myself. So um, with this one, I asked my mother about it actually, uh, because when you translated the translation of Galeb's lines would be that would be the first two lines in the Bengali. Of course, she has the Hindi, she has the Urdu, and then she translates it in the in Bangla. So Bangla, so that's what you have in the English version. We would have had a repetition of that because the first line is essentially a translation of that. So um, I asked her if she wanted me to do that and uh, give um, you know, give and. Um, uh, cite Galeb um, or not. And at that point, she thought that actually the poem had sort of taken on a life of its own and that uh, that it should be as it is. So that's why that's where that decision came from. But, you know, it's an interesting question to ask. Like there's another poem of hers that I didn't read, which in the Bengali title of it is Like Gregor's One Day Like Gregor Samsa. And uh, it's a reference to Metamorphosis by Kafka. Now, I uh, didn't think when I translated it that everybody would understand that. So I gave it the title Metamorphosis so that it, there's, a, there's a reference. It, it reminds you of something and then you go look, look it up and you, you, you know, it's answered for you. Um, 
but that's a good i mean i'm glad you asked me that question because i it did give me pause that decision i guess no, one of the things yeah. that's very interesting is isn't it the question you know we often agonize about who do we write for the question of who do we translate for or who are we translated for i mean who is this new readership this new community you know are we you know, speaking for or to um, a particular community, what is it to be internationalist? What is it to be a, a national treasure? Um, and I wonder whether that's something that perhaps Alice and Yolanda would also like to speak to because they are also poets who are incredibly internationalist, I mean, in their ways of working, something that I myself also obviously love. And um, I wonder whether there's a kind of, because the kind of diction of a translation, the kind of who is the translation speaking to predetermines what that what that new internationalism is, it seems to me. Um, yeah. I don't know, Yolanda, Kalish, did you want to speak to that at all? You know, when you're translated, who you, you know, I mean, like Yolanda, you know, you have Keith, who is a very idiomatic, gifted translator, obviously, <laughs> and um, and that makes him very able to render you as a very immediate poet who speaks directly to certainly people, readers of poetry in English. I mean, there's a tremendous, there's no, there aren't hurdles, there's a kind of complicity. Hmm. Yes, I think all of us want to be international. It's only that the only way to be international is to be also very local as a way to 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 feel uh, authentic uh, and and to uh, make you feel authentic uh, then the particularities must be of course uh, interpreted by every every translator but only being uh, uh, grounded in, in in a place we can be universal thank you Anna. to me Hi. it's when i was 20, 25, 20 years ago, uh, I felt it as an enormous relief, basically, to, to, to get out of my uh, of the boundaries of my language, um, where I thought that uh, the reception was very predictable in a way. Perhaps I was even wrong at that time, but it was my feeling, and uh, just the fact that. Uh, start my work was started to be translated gave me a, a specific freedom um, through the internationalism it, it was the freedom to do how shall I say my thing even more even more mine uh, but in the end I think when it when a poet starts to be how shall I say when when you when a poet or, or writer starts to to uh, to play a strategic game in one's head how to how to to put things how to position oneself how which traditions to invoke uh, uh, you, you already lost the game it's it's something that that must occur uh, very naturally uh, beyond thought because if it if it would be a strategic game artificial intelligence would already write the best poems nowadays <laughs> and it it's it's not we, we know it um, um, in in the in the end but we have desires and dreams don't we these desires and dreams, I think, change very much when we are facing reality. And the reality is that um, we have to feel ourselves very blessed if we have a couple of people who are interested to read our stuff and discuss it openly with us. I think this is the biggest blessing. And translators or people who are translating uh, are those people in the first instance. I, I always dream um, about, especially when it comes to prose, not so much poetry perhaps, but when it comes to prose, I dream about a very special way to write. I would write first the text in Slovenian, 
then I would co-translate it with someone into a foreign language. And then I would make corrections on the original mm. grounded on that experience. Because, you know, what I'm trying to achieve very often is what, what is just there, uh, the, the un ungraspable between languages and how you approach this in between um, every tradition, every language has its own means and one learns so much and is being enriched uh, if, if, if one tries to, to, to go that, uh, that way or to learn from that experience. Yolanda, you brought up a very important point just now when we were talking about internationalism, is that true internationalism cannot be really, and I'm inferring from what you're saying, true internationalism is not necessarily possible in the right or the most successful way if you're not deeply local. Because you know, with, the, with your very specificity of your own cultural codes and the tales and the epics and so on, you know, you are really using that to make a sort of universal statement or universalizing what you're trying to say. The other thing, and that's just hold that thought and it's for everybody to discuss, including the audience. The word internationalism, and I'm sitting in Delhi where the rain, the monsoons beating down outside my window. The word international is fraught with the sort of lens you see the whole idea of internationalism is. The world looks very different from where I sit. The map looks very different from where I sit. But the map that I'm given every day, the Mercator's map, has certain continents in the middle and certain countries on the sides. So therefore, the hierarchy of power is distributed accordingly. Similarly, with language, who are we translating for is a, is a question Fiona asked. Is it to make our poetry accessible to quote unquote English language readers by which it may or they may mean UK, America, perhaps Canada and Australia? Or is it just a way of communicating further? So, you know, it's a problematic thing because if the translations, for instance, Acrobat has first come out in the, in the US, if I'm correct. Right. Now for the US, there is a, unsaid requirement of what they expect of translated poetry. And I can already see the sort of difference in Bangla and the English that she has done. The same translation in English in India would have a very different kind of electrical pulse um, and resonance. So as Alice, you very wisely suggested that The three people reading our work is probably the most important thing. The rest of it is a very fraught question of what internationalism is because sadly in the modern world, a lot of publishing decisions and so on are really done in New York and London. And that's really a small, small point in the world where so much of the literatures are left out. Take up this discussion as you will. And if other people have questions, do address it. Who wants to take it? Well, I can go, I can talk about how my mother felt about what her opinion, uh, when she was a, she was truly a language activist in a lot of different ways. One, the first way was that she, even though she wrote perfectly in, in English and she's written a lot of poetry in English as well, some of which is included in Acrobat. When she moved back to India from England, she made a conscious decision to write only in Bengali. And that was, she always called it a political choice, which indeed it was. It was political, not so much. Uh, I mean, there was a bit of the fact that her contemporary and other poets and writers um, who were her uh, of her time were not were choosing not to write in English uh, because it was a rejection of the language of the colonizer. But with my mother, more importantly, it was a choice she made because she felt that regional languages and literatures in in India were really under threat, and that that every poet had to play her part in preserving the, the uh, regional language and literature. And she felt very, very strongly about that. Um, so 
that's why it was a, that, that is why, why she made that decision. And ironically, it may, meant that she was not shared, her work was not shared internationally. Her poetry was not in fact available to a world audience un, until now, uh, even though she had such a, she was a, one of the most prolific and beloved writers. So she has a huge body of work. But, um, and then the other irony of it is that she herself was a, a really, committed uh, and passionate and dexterous translator. So she translated women's poetry from around the world. And she was also a polyglot, she knew a number of languages. So this was something that she felt needed to happen. Not, so I think in terms of her, I'm speaking, I feel like I'm representing her in this uh, conclave and the story. So I'm sort of talking about what her opinion was. And I think she felt that the main the problem in, within the Indian context, and this is true for other uh, countries as well, that, that there were not enough translations that were done, that the translations were not of good enough quality. And when they were of good enough quality, they were not available, they were not distributed. So there, were, there was a problem of quality, a problem of quantity and a problem of availability. And she felt very strongly that until this was addressed, uh, India would not, Indian literature would not be represented fully internationally, because what happened has happened, which is also she was very excited by Indian writing in English, because she was a huge supporter of that, and she was very excited by the explosion of, of that, but of course, uh, she anticipated something that has happened to a certain extent, which is that Indian literature is represented largely by Indian writing in English right now globally, right? It is not really represented by uh, the writers who are writing in the regional languages. So this was this is just my response to the very important questions that you were both asking, or rather my mother's response, what her response would have been. Yeah. Mm, thank yeah, you we, very we, much. We, yeah, thank you, Nandana. Thank you, Yolanda and Alesh as well. And uh, there's one, one observation which, before we end, because we have run over time. Uh, as, as, as I look at the clock, but that tends to happen if the session is going really well. So that's good. You know, it's kudos to the three three people who are here. But the, the observation that John Elliott, who's who you can see on on the screen, John, would you like to just uh, articulate it verbally? You've sent it to me as a private message, but would you like to just just say it out, perhaps, John? Yeah, it, it was only that I had a, um, a poem translated into Italian um, for, for a book. And then I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to get an Italian who'd never seen the original English to translate it back into English so that I could have a look at it. And then I rewrote the poem. I mean, uh, I think Beckett did it, didn't he, with um, waiting for Godot and, and things. It, it just was a, a fascinating, a fascinating experience. Because I do think the person who translates the poems then become the owners of the poems. I always, I'm sure it's just done anyway, always copyright the translator, not, it becomes their poem. That, that is it, simple as that. Oh, thank you so much, John. Yes, very interesting. Yes, I think we shouldn't forget Chakravarti Spivak talking about the duty of, I mean, obviously a philosopher, and talking about translation of work in the Indian languages other than English into English, the duty of hospitality on the translator, the duty to do it well, to mm. make the text welcome in the new language. Mm. Yeah. Gosh, what I, fascinating I, ideas we've come up with. <laughs> we and actually, with. in a sense, I would say this conclave, the series, this one and the other one I run with, Indran, who's here, uh, the Poets and Writers uh, Studio International, the whole effort is to locally internationalize or internationalize the local or make the local available everywhere. And because of our interest, it always, almost always becomes 
a global sort of setup where we are talking about these issues. But it's been such a treat, folks. Um, thank you, thank you, Yolanda, for starting it off so beautifully. Alesh for carrying it on with such wisdom. And then Nandona for, you know, flying your mother's flag so beautifully and for the audience and all the questions. Uh, we keep the audience chat box under our control because we don't want you know, flighty things coming through. But if there is an interesting observation like John's, you know, we do try and include them in. But thank you all of you yeah. and we'll see you again. Our um, huge thanks to the poets, to Don for driving again, to the audience, and do join us again next month at the same time, but once more, huge thanks to Yolanda and Alish and Nandana for a wonderful session. Thank you so much. So much fun for all of us. Thank you for inviting us and thank you for doing this. Um, yes. And if I may say, uh, one of the things I wanted to tell Yolanda is that I was so struck by, since we spent so much time talking about translating, I loved what you said about how uh, talking in a foreign language can, make, can feel like wearing borrowed clothes. And I felt like all of the translations of the poetry that I heard today, there was no borrowed. I, I did not feel any borrowing in any of those poems. So thank you so much for making that beautiful poetic uh, observation. Thank it's you. Borrowing and embracing. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. It thank was you. a pleasure. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you and lots of greetings. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.